pleasure to be here in, in Beirut. I've been uh, work, working with Professor Melke for several years at Salzburg, and uh, as I said yesterday, I'm happy that he invited me to Lebanon for the first time. I've traveled other places in the region, but uh, it's first time in, in Beirut. So uh, what I'm hoping to do this morning is to talk about some theoretical concepts and some research applications, and it's a big, a big topic. Um, I would say that framing is perhaps one of the most popular theoretical concepts in the communication research literature. And so to try to, to summarize all the research and interesting things going on in this area in a short time, uh, it's a very difficult task. So I know we have an hour and a half uh, allocated for our session. So what I plan to do is to maybe speak for about an hour or so. Let's see how it goes. I'm going to try to speak slowly and, and carefully. I know I'm from Texas, so sometimes we, we speak in an accent. So I'm going for the translator to speak my best American English and hope that it, it works well. But uh, we'll have time for questions. So if I haven't touched on some things before the end, feel free to ask me about that, and I'm happy to, to elaborate on that. Um, when I talk about framing and to my students in Texas, they always have a lot of, of questions about the, the area, and so it's, uh, uh, as I say, it's a, also a challenge to them because it's such a broad area in so many ways. I have called it a, a bridging concept because it bridges in many ways some of the interests that uh, scholars have, academic research have, but it also is very practical to apply to professional issues and questions people have about media monitoring and evaluating the quality of media in everyday life. It is a bridge between a number of different academic disciplines in the sense that it can be applied in a very a critical way, can be a very traditional media effects style, can be applied to social movements. And so again, this makes it a bit of a challenge to try to summarize what, what this uh, concept is because it's so many things, it's, uh, you can read into it and interpret it and apply it uh, depending on your own uh, personal interests. So I'm going to uh, talk, as I say, in as general a way as I can, but maybe try to include some specific examples that might be, be helpful to, to explain. I want to put this in the context of media literacy because, uh, as Jad was saying, we're coming from the Salzburg Media Academy, and uh, media literacy, I suppose, is something that all of people in communication research are interested in, in the sense that we're trying to teach communication principles and hope that some knowledge of these principles will help anyone to become more familiar with media, more able to use media, interpret it, uh, and understand uh, more effectively. So, uh, but specifically regarding media literacy, I think there have traditionally been three major objectives. One is to understand the media system. We want to give enough information that people are able to appreciate and understand exactly how the media are constructed in a particular social system, national context, and so we want to understand something about the system. Secondly, of course, we want to uh, be able to produce one's own media. And so you're spending some time here at the MD lab and developing your own website, WordPress, and so forth, and to develop some tools for uh, developing your own platform of, of communication, which has become uh, much more easy to do than, than 50 years ago when you had to go out and purchase a large printing press and uh, purchase a uh, large broadcasting station in order to uh, do the kinds of production that uh, now we can do so easily electronically. 
So those are two. And then finally, the third one would be to decode media messages, to decode. And I think that's the emphasis that I'm going to take regarding framing, because that really speaks to this idea of, of taking media texts and interpreting them and figuring out exactly what they're trying to communicate and to come up with some tools and concepts and techniques that allow us to decode the message. So understand the system, produce your own media, but also to decode and deconstruct media messages that are all around us. I think when we talk about media literacy now, uh, this is, uh, those principles were from several years ago from experts in this field like uh, Renee Hobbs and other people who say, well, I'm a media expert, media literacy expert, like our colleague Paul Mialitis who leads the Salzburg, he would define himself as a media literacy person, okay? Um, I don't know that I necessarily define myself that way, but uh, people who do, uh, I think, might be asked, uh, how, well, how does media literacy adapt to uh, the kind of network society that we have now, the digital uh, global society that uh, we have available to us? How applicable and how relevant are these media literacy concepts and how particularly uh, relevant are some of the communication concepts like framing because media literacy and I think historically was an effort to um, empower people because there was such a tremendous focus on television and advertising directed to children. I know these were some major concerns when I started in graduate school was how to uh, better understand the effects that media are having on the public, on voters, on children, to know how much power media have and to be able to uh, empower oneself and also to uh, be able to step back and evaluate media and how they're working. So there was so much communication power concentrated in media industries um, post-World War II, let's say, uh, second half of the 20th century, that media literacy was about getting students to begin appreciating how relevant media were, how pervasive media are, how it's all surrounding. Well, that seems like a, a common sense assumption now, right? It's, uh, it's common sense that media are powerful, that they surround us, that they are uh, have these effects on it. So uh, we have social networks and social media and sometimes you'll see research uh, reports saying, well, don't people receive most of their news and information from Facebook or some other uh, social media application? Well, perhaps that, that's true. So the question might come up in the age of social media, do these concentrated centers of professional communication materials and information, do those gatekeepers, as we might say, still have as much power as they once did, or has that power been taken away and redistributed among all the people in the society? I would say uh, yes, in some ways uh, social media have certainly uh, reduced perhaps the monopoly that gatekeepers once had on the flow of information. There are many more uh, gatekeepers out there. In fact, some people have asked, what, well, is gatekeeping itself still a relevant concept? Because after all, there's this multiplicity of, of people involved in the process who are able to uh, make their own messages to to engage in communication. So I would say the gatekeepers still have power, but they have become organized in a larger system of communicators and information platforms. 
They're part of what we might call new ecosystem. People are using this concept now to refer to media because it captures the sense that not only do you have traditional media, but you have uh, citizen journalism and bloggers and all kinds of other platforms, and they're all working together. It's not that social media have are competitive with legacy media, uh, taking away things. They're complementing, they're adding to, they're doing other things than, uh, than a strict competitive uh, relationship. That's why I would say social media help complement, amplify, redistribute information um, that is produced by the legacy traditional media. And perhaps I should stop there and just make sure, I'm, am I going at a good pace for our translator? Okay, excellent. I was told we have the best translators here at AUB in the Middle East, so uh, appreciate that. Um, So that's why I would say that the um, framing is still relevant for our consideration, especially in a, a setting like this where we're teaching media literacy concepts. Yes, we worry about it in slightly a different way. Our targets are still often the uh, legacy traditional media that we want to decode, but perhaps we just interpret those concepts within the broader context of this new ecosystem. So everything I say I, I hope is still relevant. I don't think that my job with explaining framing and doing research in framing has been re rendered irrelevant or unnecessary by the growth of social media and the redistribution of this uh, media ecosystem. So let me talk about framing specifically and, and framing research in particular. And I'll try to give you some examples of my own research and some of the research and some of the cases from the different perspectives that might be helpful in, in deciding how they, they differ from each other. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to be talking more specifically about a particular application framing for, media, for conflict and terrorism and going into more depth on some of my own research into this. But for today, uh, talking with uh, Professor Melke, just kind of keep the focus this morning on framing specifically, and Thursday morning, framing with regard to conflict in particular. And I'm hoping to put framing in a more sociological context on Thursday. And so I'm really working back and forth between my my major interest uh, in terms of research. And I would say that the way I approach framing is primarily from a, a sociological standpoint. I'm interested in how framing fits into a larger context. So I really touch on the first and the third goals of media literacy, understanding the system and um, decoding. I'm not so uh, much of an expert on constructing one's own media, although I've done my best to uh, develop my own blog sites and, and websites and so forth. And by the way, if, uh, if you have any interest, uh, additional interest in my, my own personal research, I think if you Google my name, uh, we can do a little experiment here, whether if I perform uh, well in, in this region of the world on Google or your search engine, if you punch in my name, make sure you spell my name Stephen with P-H-E-N, not the other ways. There is some uh, businessman in Texas that keeps competing with me for number one spot <laughs> in Google, so I have to, maybe if you link to me, we can help me to achieve uh, <laughs> the top ranking. Uh, but I have all my research posted there, and it uh, makes it very helpful. If people are interested in reading further, uh, feel free. Uh, you can go there, researchgateacademy.edu, my own research page. Uh, more there than you could ever possibly want to, to take time to read, I'm sure. But in any case, uh, it's there. So let me talk about some definitions uh, first and then 
uh, see if we can understand what exactly this is that we're talking about when we talk about framing. Because on one hand, framing is a very intuitive and obvious word. I'm sure you have the same concept uh, of different languages. I went to Germany several years ago and I said, how do you translate framing into German? Is it framing? It's the same. Uh, but you, we think about putting a frame around a picture and focusing on some aspect of the of image or making the image look better by the way it's framed. We isolate certain aspects of an image for focus. We want to identify some, some particular part of an image. And so a frame has a very intuitive and traditional meaning. But if we say issues are framed, here is uh, perhaps uh, the most common definition if you were to search on framing. Uh, you would come up with uh, a definition by a political scientist named Robert Entman. And Robert Bob Entman has uh, developed this definition early on, and so he gets the credit for when people are talking about framing, probably see his name mentioned more often than anybody else. And now, once my my name became associated with, with the framing concept, I get all of these articles to review for journals. If it has the word framing in it, they send it to me. I, and, and sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with the things I'm interested in. So I, I send it back and I say, no, that's uh, not exactly what I'm interested in. But other times, I. I read them as best I can, and often, more often than not, they will cite uh, Robert Edmund's definition somewhere in there. And then they think they're finished with their literature review. They go on to uh, whatever they wanted to do in the first place, which is usually uh, kind of a traditional content analysis, which is uh, maybe not the way I think about framing. But in any case, uh, Edmund, from a political science definition, from a political science perspective, they're interested in issues and how political actors can take an issue and project it in a certain way so as to make it more popular and more effective and more likely to receive support from people. So the emphasis in his case is framing in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation and or treatment recommendation. Now that's a lot for one frame to do, but the idea is that framing, uh, if it's uh, full, fully uh, realized, does these things. Now I'm interested in the first four words here, in such a way but I'll get to that a little bit later. How do, how do the media present it in such a way as to do these things? That's really an interesting question. Uh, but in any case, we can think about frame uh, having these kinds of effects on people who receive it. The way it's presented, the things it focuses on have these types of effects. Another definition, different perspective, by a sociologist, William Gamson, who's at Boston College. Um, he says, frames are, quote, media packages. <clears throat> media packages. And what does that package contain? Exemplars, metaphors, what we call catchphrases. I don't know if that uh, translates very well, but uh, some little phrase. With, if you say that phrase, you know exactly what we're talking about here. Um, it's a common sense type of phraseology. And visual images. So all of those elements are packaged together, uh, according to Gamson, in a way that has the effect of, of creating a frame. I think uh, metaphor is clear. That's a very powerful function. 
if I can invite you to think about something in terms of a metaphor uh, as a very powerful uh, result. <coughs> For example, uh, back during, I'm going to talk more about uh, conflict Thursday, as I said, but during the uh, first uh, Gulf War, 1991, second Gulf War, depending on uh, the historical context, how you count them but, uh, from Americans' perspective, there were a lot of interesting headlines about uh, when the U.S. decided to go to war against Saddam Hussein. They would talk about things like war erupts, like a volcano, or bombs rain, a, rain, a shower of bombs, raining bombs, erupting. Uh, these are, are words associated with natural disaster. The metaphor is war is like a volcano. It, and so what is the problem with that? A natural disaster you can't control. War, presumably, and hopefully we can control. So if you start uh, encouraging people to think about war as a volcano, well, it just happens. You know, there's nothing to be done about it. It just happens. And all we can do is just uh, uh, deal, with it, deal with it as best we can. So you see how powerful metaphors can be, uh, that they can eliminate the sense of who's in charge and, and condition people to be very passive in terms of their uh, political responses. Okay, so we have Enman from political science. We have Gamson from sociology. And then there's this obscure professor from somewhere in Texas who attempted to uh, take all the things I had learned about framing and see if I could not summarize it in a single definition that was more satisfactory because the Enman doesn't do some things, the Gamson doesn't talk about, well, what result does it have? So. What I wanted to do is combine those two definitions and add some of my own. Um, and so sometimes uh, this definition also gets picked up. But I like to think of frames as organizing principles. Organizing principles. And the reason I think this is helpful is that many times uh, students will ask, well, where is the frame? Where is it? Is it in the the text is this newspaper article as I'm reading here. Is it is it here in the, the text, the manifest content of media? Is it some mental structure in my psychological uh, framework in, inside my mind? Is it something that's inside a social movement that's trying to frame its uh, positions? Is it something that is inside the the mind of the journalists as they're trying to organize the gatekeeper, trying to organize information, and transmit it uh, to uh, through media channels. Well, it's it's in all of these places and none of them at the same time. It's a a structure of meaning which finds itself represented in different uh, settings, in mental structures, content structures, social movement platforms. Uh, it, that's why it's such a, in some ways, a, such a helpful concept and so difficult because it, we use the same word to refer to a frame, psychological frame, sociological frame, content frame, social movement frame. So that can be difficult. So that's why I say it's an organizing principle. Once you figure out what the organizing principle is, you can see how it's manifesting itself in the, in the article. In my the mind of the reader, in the mind of the journalist, in the work of the social movement, and so forth. So I would like to, to call them organizing principles. And let me go on to, to elaborate that definition. Not only are frames organizing principles, but they are socially shared, 
So it doesn't matter if, if I have a frame, if the only frame in the world exists in my, in my head, it doesn't matter because it has to be shared. And has to persist. If it just pops up and goes away within a matter of seconds, but not interested in it. It has to be persistent over time. And how does it work? Does it magically produce an effect? It works symbolically. It works symbolically, which makes it interestingly uh, interesting to people in communication because we're interested in uh, the symbolic arena that is managed by media gatekeepers to meaningfully structure the social world. It has to be meaningful, and the, in doing being meaningful, it helps us apply structure to the social world, and. That's something that's uh, not an optional thing. We, every one of us has to do some framing in order to make sense of life, and we have to receive frames in order to make life meaningful. So sometimes I think frames are regarded as kind of like a propaganda technique, uh, a manipulation technique, but it's, it's pervasive. It's, so basic to communication, we all always are framing, and so it's just a matter of, of understanding what those what those actual frames are. We could say, um, and this is what I'll get into more on Thursday, which is that uh, questioning, well, what power relationships support those frames? That's that's really where I become interested in framing, particularly. Uh, and we want to identify uh, what power relationships support these frames <coughs> manifested in identifiable moments of structured meaning. Now that's, that's a long sentence, but basically just means we're, we want to go to those places where we can identify framing happening. And we know that it's been happening all along, leading up to that particular, let's say it's a news article, uh, some kind of uh, story. Well, framing has been happening before it ever got to that moment. So we we just happen to arrive at that moment where we can see it visible. And so we understand that something happened before that, some power relationships provide the context in which that's happening. And so that's really the broader context of framing. I already used Edmund, so we won't give him any more attention than absolutely necessary. Uh, but I think he adds uh, a little bit at the beginning to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient. So part of the way framing works is just by emphasis. Make more of something. You know, is that framing? Well, no, no not, not in my opinion. Uh, that's why sometimes there is a very strong crossover between people interested in agenda setting, what is the media agenda, and framing. And so we have a uh, conflict between those two perspectives. And so I would say it's not just a matter of emphasis, uh, not just a matter of whether you talk about something or not, but the way you talk about it, the way you define the problem, and so forth. All right, let me give you an example here which I've used before, but it's a, a really a compelling example because it illustrates, I think, the power of framing uh, by selecting a certain kind of word, a certain way of phrasing uh, an issue. And so consider a thought experiment. I'm not going to actually do the experiment here, but um, I'm going to walk you through the experiment. You can imagine how you might have responded if I had given you this scenario to consider. Uh, this is from Kahneman and Tversky, who uh, have done a lot of research on how, how we think about things, a certain way cognitive reaction, showing how people, for example, will remember their gambling um, 
in Las Vegas or wherever you're allowed to gamble in this part of the world, you uh, you always remember your gains, your winnings, and you always quickly forget your money you lost. So just those little me mental uh, tricks that we play on ourselves. But in this case, let's pretend a, a disease is coming, it's expected to kill 600 people, okay? There's this island culture, and you're brought in as the consultant, and you're given some choices. Under scenario one, under plan A, 200 people would be saved. While if plan B is adopted, there is a one-third probability that 600 people will be saved, and two-thirds chance that no one will be saved. Okay? And I'll draw your attention to the uh, would be saved uh, portion of this uh, scenario. Okay, in that scenario, 72% will choose plan A. No, I guess not. I'll sit back there. I thought I could reach the phrase, but I can't actually reach all the way. I need one of those little beams. Okay. Fix that in your mind for a moment. It's under plan C, 400 people will die. However, if plan D is adopted, there is a one-third probability that nobody will die and a two-thirds probability that 600 people will die. Now, do you notice anything interesting about plan A and plan C? would die or will save, but in any case, the same number of people will die, right? If I say 200, 600 people, 200 die, 400 saved, it's the same, right? I just put some emphasis on one or the other. So what do you think happens under this scenario if people are given the choice? They go the other way. They quickly shift their perspective and so, okay, I like the idea of saving 200 people. I don't like the idea that my plan will surely kill 400 people. Okay, it's just a matter, the same thing, exactly. All four options, A, B, C, and D, are exactly the same result in terms of the number of people dying. But the uh, result is the same. The uh, preference is different because only thing different is the words, the choice of words, and the emphasis. <clears throat> so that tells you it matters how we select words, how we choose to frame things. So let me just uh, rather quickly um, talk about some major perspectives because um, Robert Inman has called framing the fractured paradigm. The fractured paradigm is one of the most frequently cited articles in the literature. Um, and he means that everybody is doing their own thing in framing, you know. It doesn't seem to be in a unified theoretical model to, to understand. And that's true, that's absolutely true. So we have to select the perspectives that seem to fit our, our needs and our interests the best. There are three major perspectives that I think I might touch on briefly. Cognitive, Focusing on effects. <clears throat> Constructionist, focusing on sociological media packages like Gamson talked about. How do people take these materials and construct a frame as they do the work of social movement, promotion, and so forth? Uh, so cognitive, what effect the frame has. Constructionist, how did the frame get there? And critical connecting it to, linking it to power. Okay, whose interest does that frame serve? That's more of a decoding of a process and we're trying to um, understand that. So each of these three perspectives has a little different uh, emphasis and, and perspective and philosophical kind of um, <coughs> uh, approach that makes it the kinds of measures they do different, the questions they ask different, the interpretations different, 
all of them using the word framework. That's why it can be a little confusing. I would say I, I would be mainly a, construct, a critical constructionist. You know, in my own work, I'm more of a critical constructionist. I think those two together, and you'll see some examples on, on Thursday. All right, let me go through some examples and just see. I'm going to do a very simple uh, summary of some studies that are in the literature. And uh, if you want to read more about them, of course, uh, they're available to uh, look at more closely. Let's look at the language side, and I'll look at the visual in a moment. Um, for example, this is a student newspaper at my university. They talk about the headline, pro-abortion group rallies at the Capitol. Okay, pro-abortion is never a phrase that that group would, would use. They would never frame themselves that way. They would call themselves uh, choice. Yeah, pro-choice. You know, I have a choice. Always putting it in a positive way. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone's really in favor of of abortion as a as a, an act, uh, but they might say, well, you know, they're trying to balance the idea of choice and and having to abort. So that would be an example where it's you know, the student made a mistake. You know, it's a student journalist, uh, so. Maybe the student uh, herself was anti-abortion. And so she used the phrase to refer to the other group, maybe uh, subconsciously, you know? Maybe she didn't do it on purpose, but you know, you carry these frames in your head and they affect how you make the decisions. So here's a case where we had a student journalist gatekeeper, I think affected by the internal structure of her uh, mental framing of the issue and how it manifests itself in the headline. Framing human rights is a big area of interest for a number of people, a number of scholars. Uh, one article in particular uh, asked the question of how did the U.S. press frame the Iraq Abu Ghraib prison scandal? This is a, an article by a scholar named Lance Bennett who called None Dare Call It Torture. None Dare Call It Torture. And that title ex says exactly what the article is all about, which is that in the US press, um, there was a strong tendency on the part of the US elite media, the New York Times, Washington Post and others, uh, by a substantial margin, they used the word abuse, abuse, and did not use the word torture. Okay, that's a very clear preference in framing. And so you see just a little uh, word can tell you a lot about the kind of mindset the kind of psychological approach to a particular issue uh, without having to go into a deep analysis. Now, in this case, uh, I guess Bennett is a sociologist, oh, he's a communication scholar, but probably, but it's almost like uh, using a, just a word to, to indicate what's happening uh, in terms of the elite uh, media gatekeepers. So why do they, why do they do this? Who promoted this abuse frame? How, when we talk about the frame, we have to go back and understanding the media system. How, where did that frame come from? Why do they prefer one word over the other word? Well, that asks the question then, who promoted it? There's a simple answer to that, and that is uh, the US administration Use this word. They prefer to uh, to minimize the the effects of the practices they were undertaking in this uh, this setting, and so they use those words. And so the the press echoed the choice of framing, 
by simply re reproducing the same uh, vocabulary, the same word choice, same selection of framing as was being promoted by, uh, by the administration. So a simple example of where uh, power interests are promoting a certain way of thinking about an issue with a particular result. I would imagine the American public, if you ask them, uh, do you support that our troops were uh, engaged in this, uh, this policy and maybe some examples of abuse occurred, you know? So, well, okay, you know, abuse sometimes happens, not, <coughs> not going to be a big problem. But if you say, do you support American troops engaging in torture of prisoners? They would say no, absolutely not. You know, it's not something we as Americans <coughs> do. And ironically, the American president at the time, President Bush, said, we don't torture. And so, you know, it's one of these things that uh, where words really matter. Not just, uh, not just, not just a word, not just a frame. It really matters because it signifies a, a larger mindset. Let's let's take it from a word to something bigger. Okay, let's think about how an entire article might be might be framed. This is in the case of a, an article regarding the New York Times framing of of Darfur. Uh, treating the article, take the entire article of a, a, a news article and say, okay, what is the frame in this article? That's a little different approach, not one that I usually take. But in this case, they thought they could classify the, uh, every article into one of four frames. United States is savior of Sudanese people, was the most popular. Ethnic conflict, some of the less popular. Fatalist, well, these things have been happening in Africa forever, and who, who can control it? To some combination of the two. OK. But certainly, the most articles seem to be framed as, well, the United States is the good guy. Uh, we're going to be the savior of these poor people and rescue them. Well, why is that the most popular frame? because in part uh, the frame resonated with the U.S. war on terror, um, with making the, the president of Sudan the villain. You know, we're more comfortable with, with, with framing uh, enemies. You know, we like to find an enemy. That's an uh, easy, relatively straightforward framing task. And there was an implied solution, according to the Robert Entman definition. If you frame it this way, what is the solution? What is the policy consequence? Um, punishment. We have to punish this guy. Rather than find a, a solution which is re really rooted in a policy, a, deep, a long standing problem in this part of the world. <clears throat> so the frame has a reason for being there. And it also has a consequence, which is it conditions us to think about the policy in a particular way uh, than if we had framed it another, another direction. Same way, let's go back to choices of words, the US and Iraq. Um, was it a liberation or invasion? Well, I have my own beliefs about that. But the fact of the matter is that the, the journalists who were uh, independent, not embedded in, with the US military, were more likely to call it an invasion. The journalists who were participating with assistance and cooperation with the US military were more likely to use it, the term liberation, because that's the word the military was using. Uh, let me just, again, kind of give a quick consideration to uh, how verbal framing often is helpful in, for example, measuring media bias, similar concepts. Um, it helps you track the language of stakeholders. And so with framing, we're able to kind of measure how things are moving 
in a particular issue? Which direction is the, is the issue a heading in terms of the popularity of a particular way of thinking about it? <coughs> Connecting to media accounts. We can take the language that stakeholders are using and see to what extent it finds its way into the media. And so we can make a connection between those two places. Um, because sometimes, uh, obviously, people will want, parties want to frame it the way they want. So you can measure. For example, um, in the US, they're talking about different kinds of taxes. So if you say um, it's an inheritance tax, people will say, uh, well, OK, you know, you're a wealthy person. You inherited some money from your parents. It's pay a little tax on it. It's no problem. Um, but if you call it a death tax, well, you're taxing someone just because they died. You know, it seems unfair. People will say, no, I'm not, a, I'm not in favor of death tax. So the extent to which the death tax became more and more popular helps you measure how successful some of those uh, frame sponsors are, are being. All right, let me, I think I can show this quickly because I think you'll easily get the point. Uh, media frame, but some ways more, more obvious than others. Of course, the world's most, world's greatest enemy, uh, Adolf Hitler, so Time Magazine, okay, we're going to give him the X treatment. Kind of a famous uh, example. We bring it up to the more current period. Um, we look at the uh, progression of visual framing, for example, with uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. Here he's, he's pre presented in a very uh, business light image. You know, he's wearing a suit, tie, jacket. Uh, looks Iraq on the march. This might be considered a package. You have the visual and the caption, Iraq on the march. It's fairly neutral, okay? It's on the march. Who could have a problem with that? But as time goes by, you see that time begins to reimpose the kind of framing that President Bush the first used. Well, we're going to give him a deadline, January 15th. It has to be out by then or we're coming to get it. Uh, and so now you see the image of Saddam Hussein is hidden behind the numbers. His face is fragmented, is, is divided. Psychologically, almost, it looks like he's being distorted and fractured. Um, and we have this, this caption is deadline for war, OK? No longer is he on the march. Now it's we move to war. And finally, inevitably, we give them the X treatment. So, you know, this is very simple to see, but some visuals are more uh, subtle, more difficult to, to decode. So it's just a matter of, of course, uh, Osama received also in the, the Hall of Fame of uh, the X treatment. So let's look at some other examples just to give a sense of how that works. Um, I sh showed this to my wife uh, a couple weeks ago. She said, that's not you, is it? <laughs> said, no, thank you very much. Uh, not yet, although Jad uh, gave me a wonderful meal last night. I think maybe if he keeps taking me to these fantastic uh, Lebanese uh, restaurants, maybe it could be a problem. But, uh, the media frame health issues like obesity. Is it a, a matter of a personal choice? I just can't control the amount of, of food I'm eating? Or is it a matter of societal consequences? So we can think about uh, societal causes. So we can think about framing as being at the individual level or the societal level. Have a levels perspective. So we can, that matters. I think uh, historically, it was treated as a personal failing. But in increasingly, uh, the media are, are able to identify more and more uh, 
reasons why it's difficult for people to maintain a healthy weight. The, the soda, the, the beverage manufacturers are encouraging people drink things with a lot of sugar in them. So, you know, it's, if people, or, have, or they live in a community where they don't have fresh foods available, you know, it's a societal reason. So, framing can be a personal or societal level uh, difference. Credit cards, uh, how is credit being evaluated? I received an article not too long ago to review for a journal trying to uh, measure frames for, for uh, credit. And it, depending on the newspaper, they, like the Wall Street Journal, would call it uh, credit. Whereas USA Today, which is more of a consumer uh, popular publication, would refer to it more as, as debt. You know, it's, it's going to take a long time to pay this off, whereas credit is an opportunity. You could have credit, credit is good. You know, you have the opportunity to borrow money from a business perspective. Uh, so again, back to our word choice. Uh, gay marriage in the U.S. has been a very controversial topic, but public opinion is shifting uh, toward accepting um, the uh, legality and possibility of, of gay marriage. Uh, and it's a matter of shifting the, the frame from a question of human dignity, which has been more successful, from religious conscience. People, uh, the issue is, well, if I, let's say I'm a, I have a, a store that sells flowers, should I be required to provide flowers for a wedding between a man and another man, woman, another woman? Uh, it's my religious conscience. You know, I don't approve of that, so are you going to make me uh, sell them flowers. Well, that's a losing frame. That hasn't been uh, effective because uh, human, or is it a matter of human dignity? Look, uh, these people want to, to express their love for each other, their loyal, monogamous, committed relationship. Why not? So the matter of framing really seemed to make a big difference in how public opinion has shifted in the U.S. Uh, over time. Rather quickly, really, if you think about uh, the shift in, in opinion. Uh, so we can think about uh, these frames manifesting themselves in a number of ways. Um, I've, I've used some very simple examples. I, I like to take probably more of a constructivist approach and really decode the issues uh, very carefully based on the cultural information that they, <coughs> they invoke. And I'm going to uh, talk about that more in depth on Thursday with regard to uh, framing the war on terror. But um, there are two examples I might just uh, conclude with um, that I respect the scholars. One is by uh, Matthew Nisbet, and he's interested in framing science. Very important uh, issue now, because it would seem that if you have the scientific consensus uh, agreeing that there's global warming happening, and the cause is man-made, okay? 90 plus percent scientists agree. I don't know who those other guys are that don't agree, but they're in the strong, uh, definite minority. Uh, so it really is interesting how uh, science is being framed uh, for the American public because it really matters based on their willingness to support uh, particular positions. And over time, the public opinion has really become polarized on this issue. And in part, it's because scientists themselves were not really very effective at, at, at talking about their work. And so part of the recommendations by Matthew Nisbet, who's at now at uh, the university also in Boston, Northeastern University, uh, is to 
work with scientists and helping them to talk about their work more effectively because it, it really is important that they be the ones to help communicate uh, what they're working on uh, better. And the other example is uh, framing immigration. I just mentioned it briefly, where just another example of uh, looking at how an issue is framed based on all the possible ways it could be framed. So an investigation of how people are using uh, all the cultural materials to create those media packages that we talked about. That's why I say both of these uh, perspectives are in the uh, constructivist tradition. I don't know if this is uh, very readable, but I just want to give you some examples of, uh, if you just look at the, the left column here, this is from uh, Matthew Nisbet's uh, research where he talks about a typology of frames regarding climate change. Social progress, economic development, morality and ethics, scientific and technical uncertainty. And one of the ones that I think is really interesting is Pandora's box. I think you probably have that legend in uh, this part of the world. Uh, also, Franken like Frankenstein's monster. You know, if something gets out of control, you can't you can't stop it. Now, Nisbet I think makes an interesting point in his research. And by the way, his uh, blog site is available. I think it's called Framing Science. But he's done a very good job of communicating the kind of research that he's been working on uh, in his uh, projects. But he he says framing is not for or against. An issue. Framing is you're constructing the argument, constructing the definition, so that if I accept your definition, it will affect how how the, that issue uh, has effects. It will, it will affect how that issue works, what effect it has on public opinion. So, for example, Pandora's box, Frankenstein's monster. That's not for or against necessarily, but if I think about an issue of climate change in terms of Frankenstein's monster, I think that I will come to a different conclusion than if I'm primarily worried about economic competitiveness. You know, is this going to affect my job? If so, I don't want to worry about it. You know, I'm not in favor of spending a lot of money to, to try to address climate change. But if I, you know, to me, um, climate change, I've heard uh, some Nobel Prize winning scientists say, look, even if there is a small chance that we could irrevocably change the world's climate forever, wouldn't this be something we should worry about? You know, even if we don't have 100% consensus? Um, I think so. So Pandora's box, if something gets out of control and you can't put it back in the box, that's going to lead me to a certain kind of way of thinking about it. Now that's why it's interesting if you, uh, based on the work that Nisbet has done in his, uh, takes some, he's identifies the frames by doing a thorough investigation of what, what are all the ways that people could think about this, this issue? What are the ways they have thought about it, the way they currently are thinking about it? the way policymakers present it, and then um, how do people respond when messages are put in that, that frame. And interestingly, if you say, use certain frames, they'll, they'll just go to their respective corners and they'll say, look, you know, I don't care what you say, I don't believe it. But if you say, well, this is a public health issue, it's a public health issue, then people say, oh, public health issue. You know, it kind of moves them out of their, their partisan uh, conflict and they move to this other frame around here and start thinking about it in a different way. They're less likely to, to oppose it than if presented a, um, another, through another frame. And the other example I might mention just from uh, Rodney Benson's <coughs> research, uh, framing immigration. <coughs> 
another hot topic now, controversial topic, difficult topic in the U.S. and elsewhere, including, uh, of course, in Europe where people are moving around and people are worried about it, uh, worried about the impact it's going to have. We can think about immigration as being uh, a matter of global economy. Well, if the economy is going to work properly, we have to have people able to move around. Uh, we could think about it as a humanitarian issue, frame it as humanitarian. We could think about it as a racism, xenophobia frame, which is the frame that many uh, right-wing politicians put on it in a variety of countries, from France to Greece to uh, you name it. So uh, closely related, I suppose, with the national cohesion frame. Look, if we start accepting people from who, all over the place, we no longer have an identity as a, as a country. Um, now that works better in countries that are more homogeneous uh, their population. Countries, uh, the countries are more accustomed to having a very mixed, uh, diverse population. So, uh, having this, looking at this, and you say, well, the way Benson approaches it, let's take this story, you know, let's, let's take this story. He's coding articles from both uh, French and American uh, press to see how they compare, how the French and Americans compare. That's kind of a, a, way, a way to start thinking about framing in terms of a comparative cross-national perspective. So he um, he's able to do that by looking at these articles, say, okay, to what extent did it have a global economy frame? Well, maybe a little bit. But mostly it was uh, had to do with racism. So the entire article does not have to fit into only one frame. It can have aspects of more than one frame contained there. And then over the course of the whole coverage, you can see, generally speaking, where are we going in this uh, framing? How does, does this country compare to that country in terms of the frames that it uh, has preferences for? So I think in some ways that's a more uh, valid kind of way of approaching framing because you're going into the uh, cultural system and doing your work to see what what are the possible uh, meanings and ways of interpreting life that would be available for a gatekeeper uh, media people to construct a certain frame that would be available to people to, to use. All right, let me just uh, conclude here, have some time for questions. I, I just put this uh, email here just quickly, not because I want you to remember anything, but just that um, I was at a journalist uh, consultant. Uh, he's a, an academic from, uh, from Spain, and he was working with some uh, journalists in, in Jordan. And he, was, he said, hey, I'm working with these journalists here. Uh, we're wanting to do a framing analysis. Can you recommend some uh, techniques that we could use? And I actually referred him to Edmund because he wanted to do some coding of some news articles. So he said they're going to be monitoring two mainstream daily newspapers published in Damascus and three alternative uh, opposition, so-called opposition weekly newspapers published in northern Syria. And he picked a theme. The topic is uh, nuclear deal with Iran. Okay. So he's looking at, well, what are, what are the patterns? He's decided based on quick communication that we had to categorize the articles in terms of their length, their tone, and dominant frame, uh, according to Hemant's definition. So I just use that as an, just to illustrate the fact that there are a lot of different people who are finding uh, framing to be a useful way to measure uh, media messages, to use it to evaluate how issues are trending to see uh, who's promoting some types of issues and who's being more effective uh, with doing so. And finally, I would just say, uh, thinking about future questions that uh, I'm interested in or others are, are working on, I think if we think about 
um, framing, we have to inevitably start thinking about the, the big data moment. You know, everyone is, is interested in how do we take some of these theoretical concepts from, from before and see what relevance they have, not only for a social media world, and I'm arguing that yes, there's still relevance and importance, uh, but how do we translate them into big data uh, evaluation? I think, uh, to my mind, I'm still working on how to do this, but um, there, there's some interesting things we can think of. Uh, looking at word, uh, back to the words again, because now we're kind of moving, the technology is not available to really evaluate images quite as easily, but words can be electronically s stored and searched very easily. So it's a question of how do you, how do you find the frame in those uh, big data uh, uh, amounts of uh, news content. Well, you almost have to go back to the word and look at how frequently are certain words used, how are words used in connection with other words, what are clusters of words that might together form a frame. Uh, if I start using uh, certain words, it's going to indicate a frame, and we can track that using big data. If you want to see some interesting applications, for example, uh, at MIT they have a project called Media Cloud. It's by Ethan Zuckerman. Uh, I think it's Ethan Zuckerman, the founder of Global Voices, and uh, had another guy who's helping him at MIT visit my class uh, Texas uh, a year ago, talking about all the ways they can illustrate data in an interesting way using some uh, some techniques to, to map uh, issues, to map frames, to do these things. So we're still trying to figure that out. A colleague at Texas A&M is going, I want to start working with him on um, some of his data because he's got a system which is monitoring in real time television and broadcasts and social media uh, streams from uh, in Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, not English, you know, but it translates them into English. So uh, it opens up all kinds of possibilities for comparative research and framing, if we can figure out how to measure it. So that's my challenge this coming year, is to start figuring out how can we operationalize some of these definitions in such a way as to create a way for uh, big data projects like this to, um, to, to map the frame. So those are some general uh, thoughts that I would like to just uh, familiarize you with. I know that, as I say, this is the biggest uh, concept in the, in the research literature, so you have to decide from what perspective are you coming, what is your question, what are the materials available to panelize. Well, I'll stop there and we can think about some questions, if you will. Thank you.